So one of the things that we've been talking about a lot at the foundation is the idea of a culture of health. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, one of the things that we discussed today was the idea that culture comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So could you explain you know, uh, your thoughts about how people adopt you know, or develop their own culture around health? Yeah. You know, it's funny because the term culture is often um, a term that we use for other people. Other people have culture and we don't. Or culture is a kind of a freighted category. When I was teaching in the medical school at Chapel Hill, I would ask my students, where did you learn your health practices? How were your parents perhaps important in determining, in shaping your idea about when you were too sick to go to school? or whether you had to get up and go to school anyway. And we used to have kids write what, were, what we called personal illness narratives. And th through that practice, I think what you were doing is getting um, a group of future health practitioners to understand that they bring into the examining room certain kinds of attitudes and expectations about how you're supposed to behave. That is to say, are you supposed to get up and go under any circumstances? What's the line for you between being sick and bedridden and being able, having to get up regardless of how you feel? And I remember one year we were doing this exercise and most students were talking about how their parents had shaped their behaviors and attitudes towards health. And we had a student who was a student from Korea who shook his head and he said, you know, in America, you all talk about your parents being the determining factor. But where I come from in Korea, the reason why you, wouldn't, you would go to school, regardless of how sick you were, has to do with what he effectively called kind of social pressure from his classmates. That for him, though, the, the society's expectations were far more important than his parents' expectations of him. And this is something that he had grown up with for, 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 for all of his early upbringing. What I wanted to, the reason why we do this is to get students to understand that, as you say, our views about health don't just come out of nowhere. Our views about the role of individual initiative, uh, about how we should be taken care of when we're ill, or how we expect others to behave, are things that are nurtured and developed in childhood. And our parents themselves had gone through that process as well. So rather than thinking about health as something that's individualized, it's useful to think about it as moving through generations. One generation handing to another a set of expectations that I as a child have to rethink and revise as I look to my own children and, and what expectations I will have for them about how they should behave when they're, when they're ill or how they should maintain their own health. So, one of the things in your work that comes across is the importance of cultural narratives and, and to the degree to which new science or understanding emerges, it's, it, 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 it takes root most when it resonates with already deeply held cultural narratives. Mm -hmm. As you look around today and you think about what are the cu cultural narratives that shape perceptions of health, um, what do you see as those that are most important? I think probably one of the one of the enduring ideals in American health in general is the belief in, 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 in personal empowerment. The idea that I hold within you know, my own hands the ability to safeguard my own health. And this is an incredibly powerful reference point for many Americans. It underpins breast self-examination. It underpins the ability of the di diabetic to provide insulin for him or herself to safeguard themselves, it underpins prevention, it underpins why we eat, what we eat, when we eat, and how much we eat. One of the problems with this belief, however, is that it too has a kind of an overstated quality, right? It, in the sense that, you know, health is purely a matter of individual ability, individual choice, individual decision making. So on the one hand, the question for me is how do you harness this belief, harness this idea that, that we all have the power to affect our own health, but to also not allow that to obscure the fact that for many of us, our health is determined by the, our health behaviors and practices and our very health is determined by, by things that we have no control over. And that, to me, is one of the enduring tensions in American society, to both embrace the fact that people feel that they have control and want control over their health, but also to acknowledge that individual control is not the only thing that determines one's health. 
one of the, the interesting uh, stories, in, or as you, as you read your work historically, you, you look back and see how a lot of people at any given time who are the best minds of their time, you mm -hmm. know, and, and the scientific establishment, um, get a lot of really basic things very wrong to the point that we can look back with hindsight and laugh at them and how foolish they were. Um, it's not hard to imagine that, you know, 50 years from now, people will look back and laugh at us for some of the things that we believed were true. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's always dangerous to ask a historian to speculate, mm -hmm. um, but as you look forward, can you imagine some things that people will, uh, will chuckle when they think of us? Yeah, I mean, I can think of many. Uh, <laughs> there's some that I, uh, I won't predict, but I would hope would be seen as one of the, you might say, um, fetishes of our day. One, I believe, is the impulse to, th to use genetic explanation as, as a, a, a go-to explanatory move when we don't know. That is to say, rather than spend the time to think carefully about the s social factors that determine health outcomes, to think about how location, exposure, and a world of kind of social engagements drive health and health disparities. There is an inclination in our society, partly driven by this wonderful development of the study of DNA and the understanding of the genome, to embrace genomic thinking almost as a default, rather than thinking carefully about other dynamics that drive health. Now, I'm not going to say that that is entirely mistaken, but it's certainly the case that it is over applied far too widely to explain a wide range of, of, of health problems in our society. I believe that in the course of time, um, just as bacteriology had its day and every illness, the hope was that bacteria would explain everything, virology had its day and there was a time in which viruses were going to unlock the, the key to every illness. Um, vaccinations were going to solve every problem. We are going through a kind of an age of great promise for genomics. Uh, unquestionably, what you're seeing is also a kind of a, a grandiosity not to say hype associated with it, and I suspect that within my lifetime, I think we'll see a kind of a dialing back, even as the promise of genetics plays itself out. Just because you know, there's a mainstream opinion about something, you're only gonna find somebody who disagrees with that. Mm -hmm. And, and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, in many cases, they're just cranks, right? right. <laughs> you know, it's, you know there's, no, there's no real, there's, mm -hmm. but in some cases, they are you know, real visionaries. And, mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about how you look to tell the difference, um, you know, if that's a fruitful line. Of well, I mean, you know, uh, my view on that is that, um, is that times, the, the passage of time selects for, in, in retrospect, it's easy to go back and select the person who is visionary. It's, right. it's Copernicus was right. Exactly. It, at the time, it's very difficult. So yeah. the, the trick is, you know, there, there are many individuals who years later are seen as the guy who figured out <clears throat> the, the role of the of virus causing cancer. It took, you know, until 1950s to see that this work done in, two th in 1910 was a path along that, um, it was a step along that path. So my sense is that the, the, it's, it's, it's incredibly hard in any given moment to really identify that. The key for us, however, is to be aware that in the here and now, there are dominant frameworks for thinking about what health is, and there are people who are working at the edges or contrarians who are laying the groundwork, perhaps slowly, um, for a future, for how we should think about these problems. It's a little abstract, but the point is that um, we should be open to the awareness of this diversity of opinion, and that what looks like a crank or a crackpot, actually, it, with the passage of time, is, uh, is going to be seen as the visionary.